as they come in. So just wanted to welcome everyone once again. Um, welcome to an afternoon with Emma Fitzgerald. Um, and welcome to West Vancouver Memorial Library. I don't know if you can see uh, our library uh, uh, in the background there. I tried to set it up as best as I could. Um, uh, my name is Elam Zemi Pema, and I'm, I'm a librarian at the West Vancouver Memorial Library. Um, before we begin, we would like to acknowledge that this event is taking place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish people. We recognize and respect in particular the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam as nations in this territory, as well as their historic connection to the lands and waters around us. We would like to invite each of us today to think about one thing we appreciate or love about living on these lands and in this territory. For me, um, I'm super grateful to be in British Columbia and specifically in North Vancouver, working in West Vancouver um, during these unprecedented times. The having you know this beautiful uh, nature around me has really helped me stay calm and um, happy. Uh, while while we're going through these struggles, so I'm I'm so, I'm very uh, I'm incredibly grateful for um, nature around us. Um, so just wanted to say uh, so we're just going to start our presentation in just a few more minutes. But uh, before we do that, I'd like to just uh, give you some important information. Um, oh no, it's not working. Oh, there you go. Um, I just wanted to let you know where you can actually purchase copies of Hand Drawn Vancouver. So I, I don't know if some of you have tried uh, purchasing copies. Um, uh, they, it wasn't available until today. So today was the launch day. Um, so copies of Hand Drawn Vancouver are available at 32 Books and Gallery in Edgemont Village in North Vancouver. They have, um, there will be copies available at Kitts Books in Kitsilano and Edgemont Village as well, as well as um, uh, Red Horses Gallery in Dundrave in West Vancouver. So um, also just a note for, for those of you going to 32 Books and Gallery, if you mention that you're coming from the library, you will get 15% off as a, as a discount. So just keep that in mind when you, uh, when you do go uh, to purchase uh, a copy. Um, and sorry, last thing, um, if you have any questions or comments uh, for Emma, feel free to use the chat uh, below and uh, I'll be monitoring the, que uh, the questions as well and we'll, we'll have a proper question and answer session at the end of, uh, at the, end of the presentation. So um, you're more than welcome to put in your questions as you remember them, but um, also uh, just uh, if you want to add questions at the end, you can do that as well. So I'll, I'll definitely be putting those questions to Emma and she'll be answering them for you. Um, and now I'm delighted to introduce the talented author that we have all been waiting for. Uh, Emma Fitzgerald was born to Irish parents in, in, Les, Lesotho, as, um, in Lesotho, a small mountain, mountainous kingdom in Southern Africa. She moved to Canada at a young age and, uh, and spent most of her childhood in West Vancouver. Um, she went to West Bay Elementary School and attended Hillside Middle School for seventh grade before it was demolished, and then attended Crosstong House School. Emma gained an early appreciation uh, for art during painting classes at the Silk Purse Art Gallery, while also pursuing ballet and contemporary dance at uh, Anna Wyman Dance School. Her artistic talents, coupled with a keen interest in um, people and places, led her to become an author and illustrator by way of architecture. Emma received her BFA in visual art at UBC and her master's in architecture at, at Dalhousie University. She now calls Halifax, Nova Scotia home, but will often travel for her creative projects. Her latest book, Hand Drawn Vancouver, was the logical next step after documenting Atlantic Canada's capital in hand drawn Halifax. She draws mainly on location using a fine pen, adding color later in Photoshop. She's currently living in Victoria, working on Hand Drawn Victoria. Uh, please join me in welcoming Emma Fitzgerald. So I'm going to clap on everyone's behalf here. <laughs> Hello. Thank you so much, Elam. No problem. Um, that was a wonderful welcome and I was very moved. I was kind of almost crying as you expressed your gratitude for where we live and 
for me, it's where I grew up, um, the North Shore of BC. So, or sorry, the North Shore of Vancouver. So, um, yeah, I spent um, my elementary school years in Dundrave and West Van Library would have been the library I went to probably about once a week. And I have very visceral memories of, um, I don't think it exists anymore, but the children's nook that was sort of over the river. And as I got a little older and started going to more to the reference section of the library, and um, in particular, my dad set out a rule that I had to get out equal amount of nonfiction to fiction books. So, you know, I was caught up with reading a lot of novels and he insisted that I read nonfiction. So that's when I discovered the art history section of the West Van Library. And I would go there also to the um, gardening section and I, I took out so many books on Western wildflowers. So it's very special that as it turned out, I could have a launch even during COVID and that the library was able to host me. Um, for those of you who don't know, the West Van Library has also been hosting an exhibition of images from the book, um, specifically the West Van images. So that can be found on their website. And um, Taryn's colleague, um, sorry, Elham's colleague, Taryn, um, recorded my voice and integrated that into the exhibition. So you get to be read to basically and told a story with pictures, which is I think something even as adults we need and um, crave and maybe we don't realize we crave it until we have that experience but it's um, a really important thing storytelling um, so that's a big emphasis in my books is story as much as just a picture um, so that's why I don't work from a photograph I don't google the place I make sure I'm there on the street um, sitting and listening and people start to interact with me often because you're, you're taking that much more interest in what's going on. So I'd like to share some of uh, these images I'm talking about. Um, and we'll start actually, can everyone see what's going on here? I'm trusting that you can hear me and see this. Um, so, A lot of people are saying yes, so that's perfect. Okay, great. Um, so we're starting actually with my very first book. This is Hand Drawn Halifax. And as Ellen mentioned, I live in Halifax most of the time now, ever since I moved there for architecture school. Um, and this is the cover, the spine in the back of my very first book. And um, that began actually at a point in time when I was unemployed. I had been working as an architect and I needed to make some money. So I began drawing houses in my neighborhood uh, as a business, as a house portrait business. And from that, I was able to pitch an idea about a book about my neighborhood. Um, and I did that at Word on the Street, which is a festival that happens across the country, but also in Halifax. And one of the publishers got back to me, Formac, and we decided it shouldn't be a book just about my neighborhood, because that would be quite limiting. It should be the whole of Halifax and even, you know, the more um, remote places. So that's what kind of ended up actually making it really special is that people um, could see themselves in this book. It wasn't just the touristic spaces. Um, so here actually is our library in downtown Halifax, which is fairly new. We've only had this library for five years and it's a more modern building. So this actually is directly beside the architecture building in Halifax, which is where I studied. And for my whole studies, it was just a parking lot. So it's a bit of the inverse of often we, we get very upset about old buildings be, being torn down but in this case um, the parking lot kind of got a new life as a library and has been a very vibrant part of the city um, so yeah you can start to see my very quick way of drawing I don't use pencil um, I just go straight in with pen and typically a very inexpensive pen that I purchased from uh, Staples so um, yeah, I find the more expensive pens I kind of grind to the ground within a day and they're no good to me so I use sort of cheap uniball black pen and just white eight and a half by eleven paper that I then scan into the computer and add the color and you'll see the text so this is a font that was chosen by the designer of the book it would have been too much work to do all handwritten and um, not practical when of course you have to go back in and change spelling or phrasing when the editing happens so uh, the text here is prom season in the public gardens one month later on Kijiji. 
prom dress for $200 only worn for three hours. And so I'm not sure how much Kijiji is used here, but of course it'd be like a Craigslist or a, you know, an online selling option. So I remember just overhearing one of the moms talking about, oh yeah, they're just going to put this on Kijiji tomorrow. So um, there's this very temporal quality that I like to go after in my drawings where this is just a one day event and then the next things have shifted again. But of course, I've also included the gazebo. So that's something that has more staying power in history in Halifax. Um, and it's kind of the heart of this beautiful Victorian garden. Um, this is downtown Halifax. It was only about five or six years ago that we began to even have one crane downtown. And now that's changed quite a bit. So as soon as I saw this big you know, construction uh, site, I, I went there and I sketched it. And then if you go and read the book, my, my uh, the story that accompanies it isn't necessarily about what I'm drawing. Um, there's sort of a nice space between those two things sometimes. And this is on the street I live in in Halifax, some kids playing. And now I'm on to my second book. So this is sketch by sketch along Nova Scotia's South Shore. So this deviates a bit from the hand-drawn title, but it's the same concept. And I was working with the same publisher here. Um, the South Shore goes from Peggy's Cove in Nova Scotia all the way to the tip of the province and includes lots of beautiful communities. So you can see here the very distinct architecture, one building cobblestones, another made out of wood, um, but with lots of kind of gingerbread details. Um, and these are small communities that would have been very vibrant and bustling at a certain point um, when shipbuilding was happening and now are a little less uh, frequented by people but still have lots of stories and character. So that was a big adventure. Here we have um, the Shore Club, which is in Hubbard's, which is only maybe 40 minutes from Halifax. And they're, they've been serving lobster dinner since 1946. So there's shows and dances. And here you see the lobster pot outside and there the lobsters are and they're being boiled up. And there's a kind of um, a bit of a kitsch quality to this lobster painted up the stairway, but it was a lot of fun to to figure out how to draw that and uh, get that across. So these books mean a lot to me. And then when I came to BC, I wanted to um, focus on Vancouver. And actually I didn't know at the time, would I just draw Vancouver or also the suburbs, Richmond, Delta, but it, of course Vancouver is a bigger city. So it, it was necessary for me to focus a little bit more and um, just, that there's so many neighborhoods in Vancouver that I couldn't even include in this book, but I tried to get as much of a breadth as I could. I'm going to just switch gears here for a second, if I can. Um, and not sure if this is going to work for me. Ah. Uh, So this is a short animation um, that was made for me by uh, a filmmaker, Jason Lung, who lives in Budapest usually, but was here in Vancouver last summer and he made this lovely animation. So Emma? Yeah. Sorry, uh, it's not showing up on the, on the, on oh, okay. the screen. Interesting, because it's what I can see. Sharing is paused. Okay, but bring your shared window to the front. Resume share. Um, thanks for the flagging of that. No so problem. let's see here. Uh, view. Can you see it now? No. Uh, no, it's still the, the slideshows. Okay. Um, stop share. I'm just going to start again there for a second um zoom so i might have been a little too ambitious to think i could share that but um meetings i'm trying to find you all again here we are so i'm going to share my screen and here we go great we can see Is it that working okay so now I have to go back to the beginning. There we go. <laughs> OK. 
okay. So that was made um, basically by me drawing a line and then Jason took a, a photo, drawing a line, taking a photo. So it, it uh, took a, or sorry, it was actually just a time-lapse video. So I was actually sitting at this very table at my dad's house in North Vancouver and I was drawing. And in that case, I wasn't on location. We had already chosen the cover image. And uh, um, it was a bit of a simulation, but in effect, when I'm drawing, I'm on location and I'm drawing in that same kind of pretty quick manner. And that's what gives my drawings that more lively feeling, I think. Um, and yeah, I, I really appreciated his skill and expertise in helping bring that to life. Um, so that's something that's being shared as promotion for the book, but I thought it was kind of fun to share with you today. I also should mention behind me here is, is a drawing of the um, Sun Yat-sen Gardens. So that's um, at a sort of a bigger, more blown up size, but um, you, you'll be able to find that drawing in the book too. So maybe I'll go back to sharing some more uh, from the actual book itself. Um, desktop. We have expert. Okay, so can you all see the cover now of the book? Yes, we can. Awesome. Okay, so you might actually notice that there's two people on top of Science World here. For those of you who aren't familiar, the, the large circular building is, is Science World and is quite um, distinctive. It's a geodesic dome and um, I was there sketching must have been July 2017 um, with Justin Ting, who's actually a, a sketcher, an urban sketcher, and he's, he's had a book come out about Vancouver in the past year also. So we were together sketching, which normally I'm actually alone, but I think where this was actually a more ambitious thing to draw, like it's, it's a little bit um, challenging to, to draw that dome, which has a lot of technicality to it in my free-spirited way, but... Uh, Justin has a very patient approach to his uh, work. He's, he was in watercolor, doing watercolor beside me. And uh, I think being in the presence of someone else actually helped me persevere. And then as it turned out, it became the, the cover image. Um, and of course, the little details like the kayaks and the water taxi were all very, just as important as the more iconic buildings. Um, and this when you open the book, you see the um, title page. So in addition to the cover, there's the title page um, and my publisher's name, Appetite. So when it came to working in Vancouver, I needed to find a locally based publisher as my publisher, Nova Scotia, is more regional, regionally based. Um, so I was very lucky to find and work with Appetite. And I believe some of the people who've worked on the book with me are listening in today, perhaps. Uh, Robert, the publisher, Lindsay Vermoulin, Lindsay Patterson, who are both editors. Um, Michelle Argus in Toronto who's been working on promoting the book and there were in fact at least two designers who worked on the book and I don't have their names in front of me but um, it is a team effort and I was just so blown away by how it all came together so um, when you then go past the title page we open up to um, a map of Vancouver which all my books have a map in them and this is a little more fiddly than just showing up and doing a drawing on location. There's a bit more premeditation needed, but it's very satisfying after having gone to all these places to um, piece it together almost more like a puzzle and still including lots of playful elements and not needing to be perfectly perfect, but um, you know, it still got kind of combed over with the fine comb in the editing process, making sure I had things in the right place with the right spelling. Um, so this is a really fun, part of the book for me is it was putting it all together into a map. And you could see we, we, we did include the North Shore in the book, um, downtown, west side, east side, and Richmond even featured just a little bit, um, a drawing on the Fraser River. So I'm starting in West Van because of course that's where my host is based. So um, the book doesn't start in West Van, but I just thought I'd share a few of these images. So this is fishing on the Capilano River and a man from the Capilano River Reserve had created this um, fishing weir with stones. So you see these sort of circular 
patterns made from the stones and that allows the salmon to get trapped in a pool and there's nets set up and he's able to go in with a net as opposed to fishing. As you see across the river, there's two people with fishing rods. And it was important to me to include um, the reserve because when I grew up, we never talked about it. We studied the Haida, we studied the Inuit in elementary school, but we never talked about this idea of Coast Salish people or that we actually were on the land of indigenous people. Um, so I, th I think that's been a shift since I went to elementary school and, and that more and more it's being talked about and understood more widely. Um, so this was a small gesture towards understanding a little bit more at this place that, you know, we'd always drive by and drive over basically when going over the landscape bridge. And here's another image from the West Van book where or the West Van sections, should I say, where it's the community gardens and very close to the silk purse where I studied painting as a child. And um, this was an image that almost didn't make it into the book because of course you're pressed for space, but I'm really glad it did because um, I have a lot of memories of being in this part of West Vancouver as a child near the water and near lots of beautiful plants growing and the view across the water to Stanley Park. Um, and here we kind of enter into downtown. So this is um, looking down from the bridge itself onto the seawall and the freighters. And you can even see the detail of um, the leaves were starting to change color and had fallen into the water. Um, so yeah, the more time I spend in the place, the more layers you begin to notice. And if you look very carefully, there's also there's a, some people at a lookout um, across the water or across in the trees. Um, and then we arrive in downtown Vancouver, um, an iconic view of Robson Square and the art gallery. Um, again, important places to me personally, but I think also important to include places that speak to a lot of people. And there's so many people who come and use this space, whether it's for ballroom dancing in the um, skating rink when it's the summertime or skating or just hanging out. And um, of course, a lot of us probably know that the art gallery is going to move. So it was important for me to document it before it, it moved to its new location. Um, and here we have another space that's really special to me, the um, Harbor Dance, Dance Studios on Granville Street. So this is more personal, um, but looking down through the window, we see the Vogue Theater and Granville Street. Um, so kind of giving people a bit of a voyeuristic view into another world they might not have realized existed on Granville Street. Uh, as it turned out, one of my editors, uh, one of the Lindsay's who worked on the book has done tap dance classes here. So that was a fun thing to share. Um, and you see the large poster for Anna Wyman dance in the back. Um, so that's who I grew up dancing with in, on the North Shore in West Vancouver. Um, so maybe I'll read from this one. At the corner of West Hastings and Camby, you'll see the brightly hued Dominion building built in the Beaux-Arts style between 1908 and 1910. Mark Emery's cannabis culture in the new Amsterdam cafe, a vacant lot and a record store with the new Woodward's building visible behind. They all combine to create a kind of crazy quilt pattern to rival any of the fabrics found at the fabulous Dresso Supply Limited, pardon me, tooted as your selection store so Dresso is the bright yellow awning down below there. And then for me, this was a very kind of mosaic feeling of these buildings coming together. The new and the old and the kind of shabbier and brighter colored. Um, and I, I noticed that Elizabeth Wilcox is listening in, a friend from my childhood, um, my mom's good friend. And Elizabeth introduced us to Dresso as the perfect place to go get party supplies for birthday parties. So the fact that this shop was there when I was 10 years old and it's where we'd go get fabric for crafts for my birthday parties. Um, I felt a certain urgency, like I need to draw this. But of course, then there's the history of the Dominion building and the newer building in behind. So um, all of that was coming into play when I was deciding where to go to draw. And then we also have Chinatown in the book. And this is actually a publishing uh, company and bookstore in Chinatown with very distinct, brightly colored um, painting of red and white on the bricks. A ginkgo tree drops golden yellow leaves in front of the Sino United Publishing's red and white painted storefront in Chinatown. Ginkgo trees survived the ice age and have been used medicinally to improve memory. Across, across the street, a woman paints the base of a condo building. She stops to make a call to the building superintendent. I want to make sure I have the right gray. 
So that was me sort of um, playfully, but still acknowledging that the neighborhood is changing a lot in Chinatown with more condos being built. And um, as far as I understand, there is the heritage status of Chinatown, but there's still concerns about affordability and, and the survival of the neighborhood. Um, and here's that entranceway to the Sun Yat-sen Garden, which I had the bigger drawing behind me. And there's something about the simplicity of just the doorway and that promise of something beyond it that intrigued me. Um, and I love that the Sun Yat-sen Gardens and Park exist in the city and can be such a nice quiet refuge um, and such a source of nature. Um, this is back in Chinatown in the Newtown Bakery, which is a favorite place of mine to go get steam buns. Um, and here we have the garden again, inside the Sun Yat-sen Park, it is cool and calm. Um, so you see this, where I'm drawing more nature, the, the lines become kind of even more expressive and um, less up and down straight uh, than when I draw my architectural uh, renderings. And then I'm gonna just share for fun, sometimes what'll happen is I'll, I'll end up here in my drawing. So there's, um, bits along the way or, or moments in the process that are quite uh, unexpected. And this was one of them where, you know, I, I turned off the layer that kind of contains all the color, the black lines, and by mistake um, poured basically black everywhere, even in the computer, these kinds of unexpected disruptions can happen. And I really love this image. It kind of has a more nighttime, mysterious and abstract feeling. So even though these images don't make it in the book, I save them in a little folder in my desktop of my computer and sort of save them for a rainy day. I don't know, you know, if I'll print them one day, but um, that's all part of the process is sort of uh, little moments that surprise you. And I think that's what helps it feel more um, experimental and, and refreshing and that the, the work is in conversation with me also. And here we have um, Hogan's Alley, which I didn't know a lot about, but I knew I wanted to draw the Jimi Hendrix shrine on the corner because I had grown up seeing it when we drove by and was always intrigued. But in learning a bit more about it, I learned about Hogan's Alley. So I'll read this excerpt also. What is now Main Street and Union Street used to be Hogan's Alley, a black community near the still existing train station where many black men worked as porters on the trains. Some of the original black settlers in BC who had farmed on Salt Spring Island moved there. The neighborhood was raised in 1970 to make way for the Georgia Street Viaduct, which will also soon come down. The only structures left from Hogan's Alley are a blue building on the corner that is said to have been a boarding house and a small brick building that was adjacent to the famous Bias Chicken and Steakhouse where Jimi Hendrix's grandma, grandmother, Nora, used to work. Jimi used to come up from Seattle to visit. Later, there was a Jimi Hendrix shrine at the site, but both buildings were slated for demolition as I drew. In a victory for the community, affordable modular housing has been built since the demolition named Nora Hendricks Place to honor her memory. So kind of in exploring deeper this knowledge that I had that those buildings had something to do with Jimi Hendrix, I learned about a black neighborhood that had been erased. And then for going further learning about, you know, really the only job for black men at the time was at the train station as porters and which necessitated the neighborhood being there. And then the erasure of that neighborhood being quite similar to what I've learned about in Nova Scotia and Af Africville. So, um, building kind of on my own some of this history that doesn't get taught but with conversations that are happening now they're hopefully going to be taught more in the school system and get talked about and understood um i do have also this house in strathcona which is not far from uh, the previous slide the chan house is is a significant building in strathcona vancouver's oldest neighborhood Former residents Walter and Mary Lee Chan stood up against urban renewal projects in the 1960s when there were plans to raise houses to make way for a freeway through downtown. So at one point, both Strathcona and Chinatown would have been demolished and uh, we would have had a freeway that probably we'd be taking down now again. So um, that is a history of activism that I didn't know about before until I started to walk around that Strathcona neighborhood. And there's actually a plaque in front that alerted me to the history, which is why, you know, there's so many ha beautiful, colorful houses in Strathcona that I could have drawn, but it was important to choose this one. And I've since been in touch with the current owners who are, is the son and daughter-in-law of Walter and Mary Lee. And they've done a lot to 
keep the building up to code. It had to become earthquake proof. Um, and that was a big expense, it being a heritage building, and they had to do it a very particular way. But they have managed to preserve this, this history for the neighborhood. So um, that was another incidence of a, a story and learning as I go and learning as I draw. Um, so I think I'm almost at the end here. I do have this image of Trout Lake to end because I know we're all longing for these beautiful summer days that are kind of around the corner. Um, this was probably around August. I went to Trout Lake, which is in East Van, just close to Commercial Drive. Summer is cresting and will soon be over, but people take advantage of any chance to be near water, including the beautiful Trout Lake in East Van. While sketching the popular swimming hole, I run into a friend I haven't seen since high school. Her young son crouches close to me in that familiar way that kids of a certain age do. How do you draw the wind, he asks. A very good question, I answer, as a warm breeze fans the surface of the water. So sometimes kids ask the best questions, but I, um, I look forward to answering your questions. And uh, thank you so much for your time and attention. So I will just end there. Perfect. Um, so there have been already a few questions. So I'm going to go right to the top there. Mm -hmm. um, so one question from Lori. Uh, when you are drawing cobblestones, do you draw all the individual stones or bricks? Or do you impose some kind of pattern that is available on the computer? OK, yeah, no, I, I just sort of go on automatic and I just keep drawing them. So. Uh, in Nova Scotia, we have a lot of shingles, so I get very used to sort of this L, that L, 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 basically, that all fit together nice and closely. And then, yeah, same with the bricks or the cobblestones. And, um, yeah, I, I don't actually have the technical know-how to know how to do it any other way. So there are sometimes moments where I forget to draw a window. For instance, if I get so gung-ho with my bricks that I, I forget to look up and see that there's a window, uh, and then sometimes I'll draw the window off to one side and cut and paste in the computer and impose it in that way. Great, thank you. Um, so um, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, add the question in the chat box. Oh, I see lots pouring in now. Um, so one question from Marilyn. Um, I apologize that I tuned in late, but can you tell me if you're using an iPad Pro with Procreate or what is your technology? Also, do you sketch on site or take a photo and finish up at home? Um, so I signed up for a course to learn how to use iPad in September and I never managed to find the time to do this online course. So I'm still using Photoshop. So I, I just scanned the drawing in and basically I became very comfortable with that in architecture offices. Often my boss would draw something by hand and want it to be colored, whether it was a map or a conceptual sketch. Um, and it was only at the time when I started my house portrait business that I kind of brought those skills together with my more sketchy hand drawing style. And I, I did see a question, someone else was wondering if I've used watercolor. And, and that's what I used a lot as a kid, especially, and even in my adult years. But I feel like I gained a lot of useful knowledge of color and contrast and what I'd like to achieve when I practiced watercolor. But when it came to my business and the books, I wanted something more um, uniform and predictable, even though, of course, I shared that sometimes the color spills everywhere and I get unexpected things. But I liked that, that crispness paired with my more messy style. So I feel like if I was working in watercolor, a lot more is left up, up to chance, at least when I'm doing watercolor. <laughs> I've never managed to master watercolor myself. Yeah. So yeah. kudos to those, to you and to those who can, who can master it in the moment, that's perfect. And I, sh I should say that, yes, I do draw on location and I, I generally don't take a photo. I'll usually actually take notes about the color. Even sometimes, you know, if the door is red, I'll just sketch a little R for red and erase that when it, I'm bring the drawing into the computer. And that's for no particular reason other than I think, um, I like the process of working from my memory and, and flexing that muscle. Hmm. Uh, the next question we have here is, do you ever lead neighborhood sketch walks in Vancouver? I would love to attend. <laughs> yeah, awesome. So I did do one of those when my Halifax book, I launched it in West Van in 2016. I did a Jane's walk. If people are familiar, there's these walks through the city that 
um, celebrate Jane Jacobs' birthday. I'm sorry that there's a bit of beeping right now, but I'll just keep going. Um, and uh, definitely would like to do some more things like that. And I have taught adult workshops also, but yeah, with COVID, it's, it's a little bit more um, uncertain when exactly that will happen and safely, how can that happen safely? There is a, a organization called Urban Sketchers that you can all look up online and they have a Vancouver chapter that regularly meets up to do um, sketching together. But I know that since COVID, they've been doing that online. Um, the next question we have here is um, any sneak peek of your current or next project? So the best place to find out about that would be if you are on Instagram, I'm Emma Fitz underscore art. Uh, that's Emma Fitz underscore art. And I am kind of posting as I go my process. Um, but as my editors and publisher know, we, we work at the very beginning stage of that process. So it's going to probably be two years at least. I think, I don't know, <laughs> trying not to think too much about um, that until maybe next week, but yeah, it's, um, it'll be shared as I go uh, online. And I imagine I might start selling cards and prints in shops even before the book comes out. Um, but again, with COVID, everything's been a bit slowed down. Uh, so Emma, just to clarify, your next project is hand-drawn Vic Victoria, is that right? Yes. Yeah, so that's why I'm living in Victoria right now. I moved there three months ago and I'll be there for the whole year to draw all seasons and, and uh, get the real feel for the place because th this is unusual in that I, I've never lived in Victoria before and I don't have the same history I had with Halifax or Vancouver, but I'm finding it's a really interesting mix of what I love about both Vancouver and Halifax. It's got that you know, um, smaller size and scale and a lot of history and heritage, but it also has the kind of nature that I'm used to growing up in Vancouver and um, I'm actually really bowled away by how much animal life and plant life there is and really enjoying my walks in the neighborhood where I'm living right now. I, yeah, I've been, I've been to Victoria before and it's beautiful and I'm <laughs> sure those of you who are from Victoria just watching this presentation today will agree with everything that Emma just said. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, any other questions? From the audience, can we? Uh, Taryn is asking, can we purchase any of the images from your book? Yeah, so I have uh, just dropped off cards to 32 books in Edgemont Village. So they're selling my cards as well as the Blue Teapot in Lonsdale Key, which is a, a tea shop owned by a friend of mine. So I'm going to slowly be getting more um, stockists and the shops. Uh, I had previously been selling at uh, Paper Yaw and Granville Island and Rath Art Supplies on Main Street. So um, again, like I keep saying, COVID is kind of, everyone's catching up with themselves, but as I'm here a bit longer, I will get more shops and, and that kind of thing going. And you can feel free if, if you have a shop that you feel like I'd really love if you had them as cards, you can, you know, give them my website and tell them about the book and they can get in touch with me. Great, and, and I'll be looking for that as well well um, as, as people are, um, as bookstores and, and other art stores are opening up. So I'll keep a lookout for that as well. Um, our next question is, can you tell us a bit more about why you like exercising your memory muscle? Do you do color checkups? That's a good question. So this is a question from Naomi and um, you had mentioned that there was someone listening from the generative nest. So I should say a big gratitude to Naomi because she had a weekly writing, write, writing group at uh, her family home um, on Camby Street. So every Wednesday I was going there and the discipline of that was so nice and really helped the project keep going. So I would say the discipline of memory is important, Naomi. And, and maybe, um, yeah, if, if I were to be just relying on a photo, it would be different. Um, so, yeah, and I think color is such an emotional thing like it, it took a while to settle on the green for the book and now you see i'm wearing a green t-shirt and it's all about green but um initially i thought well what about a gray book because you know, we can look outside today and it's very gray in vancouver but i'm really glad that we found a color that also defines vancouver the green and that kind of beautiful fresh um feeling you get here with all the nature so um color is something i think about a lot and and hopefully that muscle won't won't go away anytime soon but 
by chance, I'm also wearing green and it's totally uncoordinated, but I am oh, glad that worked out. <laughs> um, so the next question is from Eskimal Recreation. Any recommendations regarding online Photoshop tutorials? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't know the answer to that. Um, you will find that a lot of these urban sketchers have their own websites and tutorials. And there's something called Sketchbook School, which Danny Gregory began. He's a um, an author and sketcher who lives in New York City. So if you look up Sketchbook School, but S-K-O-O-L, uh, you might find something useful there. For me, I was very lucky that I was never inclined to learn Photoshop. Um, even when I was in art school, I it felt very overwhelming to me. And then it was only when I was forced to in architecture and I had classmates around, some who had come out of you know, graphic design programs. And I remember the very specific moments when I gathered the few skills that I still have. It was at midnight and last minute before a project is due and I'd ask someone, how do I do this? And they'd help me. So I, I learned in a very, by the seat of my pants kind of way, but um, I know there's resources out there. If, if people are looking for more tutorial, um, video tutorials, we do have lynda.com uh, that's available to uh, West Vancouver residents if, if you'd like to um, check that out. Uh, YouTube has a ton of um, options as well. Um, you can always call us at Library Connect and we can find, we can create a list for you and we can send you that list of um, different options for you to explore. So um, um, feel free to use us, us you know, librarians to help you find those things. Um, all right, so the next question for you is, can you tell us about the image behind you? So this was, um, I did a presentation a bit earlier, or last week, I guess, um, with the Sun Yat-sen garden. So I had just printed out large and just decided to put it up again. Uh, so it's the actual garden. And you see the koi, the fish in the pool, and the little boy. And um, Again, it, it was green, so it, it felt like the right thing to, uh, to share with you today. Thank you. Um, next question is from uh, Poppy. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Are you still working as an architect? Not anymore. So for six years, I've been self-employed doing books, and then a lot of my income does come from um, selling cards and prints, whether in shops or craft fairs. Um, and I take on different commissions and sometimes I still work in an architectural way where um, I actually have my drawings are going to be in the um, uh, rooms in a hospital for children, uh, the IWK hospital in Halifax. So children, when they're coming out of their coma, they're going to see my drawing on the wall and that's going to be very satisfying. And I've also worked with restaurants and um, a tourism company where my drawings are on their, their van. So um that kind of satisfies my itch for having a bigger scale or bigger impact. Um, but I'm not interested in doing uh, quotes and working in with much more liability the way you would as an architect. Um, I'll give some people more time to ask questions, but Emma, actually I have, oh no, there, there is one more question. Okay, I'll leave my questions to the end then. Um, Lindsay says, uh, you mentioned Vancouver as feeling like a sort of gray city. Is there a color you associate with Victoria so far? What about Halifax? That's a good question. Um, well, I, the, the Halifax book, I think, I think this is it's sitting on the computer sitting on it. it. It turned out to be a blue color. Um, but actually this kind of Tiffany blue, Victoria has been very blue sky since I arrived there. So it's been quite amazing how often I wake up and it's, it's beautiful blue sky. And then whereas in um, Halifax, so many of the buildings are brick. So there's a kind of red warm color that I associate with the, uh, those brick buildings and, and even the, the brightly colored houses. Um, so there's a lot of variety, I would say. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so I'll give some people extra time to write down their questions. But Emma, my question to you is, um, when when you when you're sitting down and and uh, uh, you're inspired to to sketch, are there moments where you're like, oh, I don't like that, and you know, like you want to change a few details? Do you do you just restart all over again, or do you find that oh no, you know what, I'm gonna I'm just going to keep going, you know, and finish, finish the final product. 
That's a really good question. I am, um, when I do teach, basically I think the only thing that I really know how to teach is, is to sort of train people to keep going. Like that's my big philosophy is that you, you're always going to have those negative little voices, but if you keep starting over again, you're never pushing through and realizing, oh, this is actually going somewhere. Um, so on the very rare occasion, I'll realize this is a four story building and I don't have enough room and I really should have started, you know, possibly at the top and work my way down. Um, but very often I actually start in the middle of my piece of paper and it grows out in all directions. And I think that just comes from enough practice that I can trust that I have the boundaries I need um, within the page. So yeah, I've, more often than not, I keep going even when that little voice starts happening and I'm saying, oh, this isn't what I thought it was gonna be or it's not so good or, yeah. That, that's actually very encouraging because I think a lot of us think, oh, artists, you know, they, they, they probably, whatever product that they create, it's always perfect. And, you know, they, you know, they purposely chose this or that, but I guess it's just a process and it kind of, you go, you go with the flow with things and that, um, I guess a lot of, a lot of artists kind of go through that. And I, I would like to keep that in mind for my own work. Um, definitely. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Yes. Um, the, Follow-up question I have for you for that is uh, for all those young um, artists just starting off with sketching and, and drawing and painting, what are some of the um, suggestions that you'd give um, as a starting point? Yeah, I mean, often when I'm working with kids, I'll talk about drawing and art as though it's a sport. Because I think the kids who love to draw, they don't need to be converted, but there's a lot of kids out there who think, well, I do soccer, but I don't draw. or um, and, and get kind of caught up in this is what I do and this is what I don't do. So for me, I grew up dancing and I feel like there's a lot of correlation between moving in space and drawing. Um, so I'll give advice like, you know, just like when you look, when you're playing baseball, you're looking at the ball as much as you're thinking about what the bat is doing. So a lot of kids won't actually look at what they're drawing. A lot of people in general, you'll draw your idea of what it is. And then that's actually when you kind of lose a big source of help because looking is what's going to help you know what to draw. Um, if you drawing what you think it is, but you're not kind of helping yourself out if you're not looking. So, um, and even ideas of you wouldn't kick a soccer ball kind of like this, unless you were going for that particular technique and same goes with drawing. Why not try and relax your arm? Why not try and keep your wrists free? And, uh, and use a smooth line. Of course, if you want to create a dark, scary atmosphere or a light, feathery feeling, you might go a little bit more jerkily. But um, yeah, I think that bringing in that dimension, of the physicality of it, uh, helps kids. Thank you for sharing, Emma. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, my last question uh, to you is: um, when you're when you're looking at a particular city. What, what aspects of the city do you, do you, um, that, that attract you? Like, is it, is it the history? Is it the, the cultural background? What, what particular aspects of a city stand out to you? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot for me that tied up with nostalgia. Um, so if, if I've had a particular experience somewhere, but I think also having your finger on what other people might also be interested in. Um, and often that, just comes out of this kind of dance almost because I'm drawing in a neighborhood and then someone will talk to me and then I'll learn something that I didn't know before. Um, so it's more about showing up. Like when I went to little India in uh, Vancouver, I had memories of going there to buy my grad dress at you know, this one of these fabric and dress shops. And so I thought when I went there, that's what I was going to be drawing is one of these shops. But then the garden stood out to me so much that people, planting their own vegetables and flowers for praying, prayers. Um, and so I ended up knocking on someone's door and asking them permission to draw their house. And they, they said, no, but you can draw the garden. And then we had a conversation. So yeah, I went with a particular thought in mind, but it deviated, but it actually became even more meaningful because of that. Yeah. Thank you. Looks like we have one more question here from Lori. Um, your storytelling is beautiful, Emma. I love the way you overhear something and write about it. How do you nourish the writing side of your practice? 
So thanks for this question. Laurie is a writer who lives in Victoria who I've met fairly recently. And um, I really respect writers because in the same way that most people are, in, or a lot of people are intimidated to draw, I'm a bit intimidated about starting to write. Um, so that's where the drawing really helps as a prompt for me. So I do the drawing first to have the experience and then the writing kind of writes itself. And I think um, word choice and phrasing comes just because I've read a lot. So going back to being a kid and reading a lot, um, I don't work at writing so much, but when I show up to do it, I'm glad, you know, oh, I have a lot of words at my disposal, disposal because I like to read. But I would like to, to experiment and see what would happen if I wrote for 10 pages straight, but I haven't done that since I was a kid. <laughs> But I, I find that even the, the sketches are part of the storytelling as well, right? It, uh, I find that a lot of, even just looking at your, the photos that you were, sh uh, the, the sketches that you were sharing, there's a lot of detail and a lot of um, storytelling in itself. And it kind of, um, each image kind of invokes a specific feeling from, from what, I've, what I've been experiencing. Um, so I, f I find that it, your, your sketches are so good at, um, like use it, you use words and, and the sketches so well to, to share that one particular story. Um, so I just wanted to say kudos to you. Your, your drawings are incredible. And I, I loved listening to your, to your wonderful stories about Vancouver and West Vancouver. Um, I'm sure everyone else um, loved it as well. So just wanted to say thank you so much, Emma, for being here today. We are incredibly lucky to have you. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, just on last note, I'm just gonna uh, just share a couple of things. Um, let me see if I can share my screen here. Maybe um, I can quickly mention, I know you've shared mostly the stores available on the North Shore to buy the book, but in mm. fact, anywhere you live, if you go and ask your independent bookstore, they should be able to stock the book. Um, and there are, online options but right now of course it's, it's really nice to support the independent bookstores but for instance iron dog or paper hound or um massey books all these bookstores if you approach them i'm sure they would have the book in for you great um okay so um, and we can always if you if you have questions about which bookstores uh, which local bookstores are um that carry emma's uh, copies of of her books just, just give us a call at the library and we can we can help you find it as well um, and just on a last note I just wanted to share some of uh, Emma's um, other titles um, let me just pop that open here here we go um, so yeah um, in case you're looking for other titles uh, by Emma Fitzgerald uh, at the stores or at the libraries, uh, these are her other titles. Um, again, you can give us give us a call at the library at Library Connect, and we can we can help you uh, uh, locate some of those books. So in our library, we have hand drawn Halifax as well as sketch by sketch along Nova Scotia's South Shore. Um, so just give us a call if you'd like to put a hold on it. Um, and here are some of Emma's book recommendations if you're interested in pursuing uh, more about sketching and about Vancouver. Um, we, uh, we don't have the first one, uh, but we will, uh, I will be just talking to our collections librarian to, to purchase that. But we do have Vanishing Vancouver by Michael Kottner in our collection as well, if you'd like to place a hold on it. Um, and that's that's it. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, I'm going to share my video here. So yes, thank you again, Emma, for being here. I'm so we're so grateful to have you. Thank you to all the um, audience members uh, who joined us today and, and gave us such wonderful questions. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to give a big round of applause to, to Emma. If you could show your appreciation in, uh, to Emma in your chat, in the chat box, I would really, uh, I would be grateful. So thank you, Emma, and uh, thank you all, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.